There's no worse feeling than creating an amazing VR experience, but then realizing that it doesn't actually run at frame rate on the device. Today we're going to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. Okay guys, so today we're going to be talking about macro optimizations. And what I mean by that is these are all the things when creating a project for Quest 1, Quest 2, that are going to save you milliseconds on the frame. And when your frame budget is only 13, 14 milliseconds, that's a very important amount of time. Okay, so first of all, when you're creating a new project, you're going to have to pick URP. Don't think that you can get away with the HDRP. I'm telling you that you can't. It does a lot of post-processing. It does like procedural atmospheric effects, things like that. A lot of it's very physically based, which means that it takes more compute to run. The Quest cannot handle that. You're going to have to use Universal Render Pipeline. From there, Unity has two further options for their rendering pipeline. You can use forward or deferred. By default, it's gonna be forward and you're gonna to wanna to stick with that. It's the way better option for Quest um, and just mobile chipsets in general. So nothing to do there, just make sure that you don't change it from forward to deferred. So when developing for a mobile chipset, which is what's in the Quest 1, Quest 2, you know, in all iPhones, all Android phones, it's important to know that they are very bandwidth constrained. And what I mean by that is that they have a very hard time moving textures around, moving memory around. So when you send a texture to the GPU, when you take a texture off the GPU, this is all very hard for them. It takes them a long time. And so a lot of these optimizations revolve around doing less of that, or specifically a part of that that's called a resolve, which is when you write to external memory and then bring it back to use in your rendering process. So that's important to know moving forward. So in line with that, the first thing that we'll talk about is making sure that your textures are not overly large. Uh, it's easy when making a game to import a texture and be like, yeah, let's make it as high resolution as possible. I want this thing to be 4K, I want it to be 8K, that would be crazy. That's gonna really hurt performance. So if you come into your textures, this one right here, drywall, it itself is 512 by 512, that's very good. I would recommend staying below 2K, you can do 2K, but just that or anything below it. So you see they have the max size here. If you import a texture and it is 4K, you can go into max size, set it to 2K, click apply, and it'll actually reduce it. So just check all your textures and make sure they're not over 2K. The next thing that you're gonna to wanna to consider is your usage of HDR textures, and basically that you don't want to use them. If you're unsure if a texture is HDR, the easiest way to make sure that you're not doing HDR in general is to go into your quality settings, these ones right here, and make sure that HDR is turned off. You see it's already turned off for those two. The only one it's on for is the high quality setting. So you can just go ahead and turn that off. It should be noted that even if those are on, I don't believe the camera actually does HDR unless you have a post-processing volume that is specifically HDR. So you should be good anyway. The next thing that kind of goes in line with that is that you don't want to be doing any post-processing on the camera. This is going to add a few extra steps to the rendering process and is really too much for the Quest 1 or Quest 2. And so basically when you start the Universal Render Pipeline project, it does come with a post-processing volume. So you want to get rid of that. Just make sure that you don't use anything like that. And you can probably just go ahead and turn post-processing off on the camera object itself. So that's going to save you a few milliseconds per frame. And speaking of cameras, make sure that you're not doing any double camera stuff. And what I mean by that is you have this main camera here. Sometimes you can get a cool effect going if you create another camera and you um, render it out to a texture or something like that. That's just going to be too much for the Quest, unfortunately. An example might be if you have a driving game and you have mirrors um, that you can look into, you would use another camera to make those mirrors. The reason you can't get away with this is that it's too hard to render on top of the fact that you're already rendering two eyes to render the scene another time for another camera. It's just too much for the Quest. Another important consideration for VR that's a must have is that you change the stereo rendering mode to multi-view. On PC, it's gonna be single pass instance. On Android, it's gonna be multi-view. And the next thing that we'll talk about is if you look in your quality settings, so universal render pipeline medium quality, let's say, you have a main light, which is per pixel, and you're going to want to keep that. You can save a little bit extra if you switch this additional lights to per vertex, but it's not really necessary. You can probably keep that per pixel. The reason you can keep that is because the universal render pipeline is what's called a single pass rendering pipeline. So basically when something is being drawn, something like this helmet, it used to be that if you had too many lights, let's say eight lights, it would actually have to draw it multiple times. It would draw it one time for the one light, 
another time for the other light, uh, three times, you know, depending on how many lights you had. But now you can see how many lights you can actually get away with by looking at your quality, your quality section. So you have one per pixel and then an additional four. So you can get away with five lights. I would not necessarily recommend five lights in your scene um, because it will have performance implications, but just know that you can get away with that and still keep it single pass. You really, really do not want to have extra lights that are causing this helmet to be rendered three, four times um, because the CPU on the mobile headset is just not going to be able to keep up with it. So just make sure that you stay within those bounds here. And it should be noted that baked lighting will not count towards this. This is only real time lights. So if we click directional light here, the mode is mixed currently. So it's acting as both a real time and a baked. If it was baked, it would not be contributing. Um, if it's real time, it will be contributing to that count of five lights that I have accessible to me. Okay, and everybody wants shadows, but shadows are actually particularly tough in VR. I'm not gonna tell you that you can't have them. The situation has gotten better. It used to be that you couldn't have any, but now I just have a few recommendations for you if you're going to use them. It's still best that you do not. I'm just gonna tell you that. If you can get away without using them, that's great. But if you're going to use them, just be aware of what they do. So if you look at this light, it's the only one I have in the scene, and it's casting shadows, and we look up here at the batches, and batches is a CPU problem, um, which is generally the problem nowadays on headsets. It's currently doing 68. If I have no shadows, it's now doing 39. It literally cuts it in half. When I have to render an object, if it has a shadow, it's gonna cost an extra batch. So this helmet, it's one batch. If I have no shadows, it's two batches if I do have shadows. So just keep in mind that's a huge performance implication. Now, that being said, if you do want shadows in the game, which most people do, what you're gonna wanna do is only give shadows to the things that actually need it. So anything that I can bake, like this wall right here is not gonna move. You would wanna bake that shadow in. And if you're not aware of what baking is, I'm not gonna go over it here, it's a pretty complicated topic, but there's tons of videos on YouTube. I'm sure you'll, you'll find some good ones, so you should check that out because it's a very powerful concept as well. But basically, you'll want to go into your universal render pipeline quality settings again. And if you're going to have shadows, make sure that this shadow resolution is as low as you can handle. The lower, the better. You're probably not going to get away with less than 1K. And make sure that your cascade count is 1. Any more than that, and it's going to cost you one of those resolves. The thing we talked about that those mobile headsets just hate. It's going to cost you like an extra millisecond or two per frame to have these cascades here. So make sure that that's one. If the shadows are looking bad, you can lower the distance. So you'll see if I lower those far enough, eventually they go away. Sometimes you only put shadows on the things that are close so you can get away with that. And then you can lower the resolution uh, depending on how sh close those shadows are, things like that. My next recommendation for shadows would be to only have the things that need shadows actually render the shadows. For instance, let's say that this headset moves around and so it needs a dynamic shadow. I, if I can get to it, the safety hat here, I can go in and turn cast shadows on or off. I'm gonna keep it on. But let's say that this wall here, let's say that I just turn shadows off for that one. And now I bake those, I bake the shadows for this and I keep this one dynamic. So now when it's rendering the shadows, instead of that 68 to 34, maybe or 68 to 39 draw calls or whatever it was, it would just be 39 to like 42 because I'm only rendering three objects that actually have shadows. Okay, and the next thing you're gonna to wanna to look at is making sure that you're not using more materials than are necessary. And the reason I say this is that each material is gonna incur an extra draw call, uh, an extra set pass call. It's basically gonna to have to set up the rendering pipeline to make sure that it can render that new material. Whereas if it's the same material, it kind of just keeps on going. It doesn't have to set up anything new. And let's just look at an example here using the scene. If I just take any of these materials that are being used for something else, let's say the hard hat, and I put it on something random, let's say the floor, let's see what happens to those numbers. Okay, so you can see the batches went down and the set pass calls actually went down as well. So basically the less materials you have, the easier it's gonna be on the CPU and the GPU. So that's another thing to consider. Basically, I'm just saying don't get crazy with the materials. I'll tell you that your per frame budget is normally around 100 batches. I don't know how many set pass calls, but you don't want 100 of them or anything like that. 
you're probably looking for 100k verts, 100k tries. If you stay under that, you'll be good to go. But as soon as you're higher than that, you're going to start running into problems on the Quest 1. Probably not the Quest 2, it's probably a little bit higher. Maybe like 150 batches, something like that. Um, I haven't stress tested it. Okay, and the last thing that's going to trip you up, and probably honestly the most important, I saved the best for last, is that you need to be checking if your code is generating garbage. And the way that you're going to check this is by, first of all, running your game, then opening up Analysis, Profiler, and you can basically then stop it after getting a nice sample, go through, click jar Garbage Allocation, and just check if any is being allocated on a per frame basis. It is okay to allocate some garbage. Let's say you allocate it like every time the user clicks K on the keyboard, or sorry, this is a VR game, every time the user presses the grip button. What's not okay is allocating it every frame. So you're gonna have to check for that. And this is the kind of check you're gonna wanna do throughout the duration of your project. I'm telling you that any garbage allocated per frame, it doesn't matter if it's four bytes, eight bytes, that's gonna really quickly build up um, and give your game some frame rate issues. So just stay away from that. Okay, so here's an example where I actually was generating garbage per frame, 136 bytes. But how is this actually generated? Well, let's click this, let's open this. We see it's right there, go down. It looks like garbageboy.update is the thing that is creating that garbage. So that's an easy way to find it. So let's take a look at that script. So the easiest way to generate garbage is basically by creating a class in a local function. So this function runs every frame and inside of it, I'm creating a new class instance of garbage. Um, and it's just called garbage. That's not what makes it garbage. And another easy way to do this is to create an array of classes or just arrays in general will generate garbage. So things that won't generate garbage are like ints. You can have a local int, that's gonna be fine. Or um, structs, like if you have some sort of like my struct, which I don't, so it'll throw an error, but my struct y, um, that won't generate garbage either. So if you can get away with using a struct or a primitive, that's gonna be good. So basically when you go into your class and you realize, okay, these are the things that are creating garbage, you just either need to instantiate them um, globally within the class or like have a persistent array and then just use the values within that array. Basically, you just can't be creating a new object. For instance, the way I would solve this problem with the array, because a lot of times you do need arrays in a local function, is I would probably instantiate it outside of the local function and then that way you always have a persistent um, garbage array. Sorry, now I'm regretting naming it garbage. I should have named it something else. Uh, it could literally be anything else. You'd have a persistent array and then within you would probably just um, work with it. You just overwrite whatever values you had before, uh, you know, whatever. You can do whatever you want, but basically now it's a persistent version so it doesn't become garbage after that local function is done running. Okay, and the last thing I'll say is that I did create another video called the project settings, something project settings that you want for VR. I did not necessarily go over all of those in this and those can be important for performance as well. So you'll probably want to check that out. It has to do with texture compression, things like that. Just some settings that you need to make sure you have an optimal experience on Quest. And I'll say that while I was hard on you guys, giving you a lot of restrictions, it's really going to help you out. But there's a silver lining. You, once your game is coming along, you have a lot of the concepts in, a lot of the core, like gameplay, things like that, and you're still hitting frame rate. You deployed to the device, the Quest 1, Quest 2, and it's totally hitting 72 frames a second, 60 frames a second. You can actually start adding in some of these things that I said that you couldn't. Basically, just understand that these are the things that really can hurt your performance. You probably want to go without them if you can, and then you can slowly start adding them in. Like, maybe you can get away with post-processing um, once the game is over, and now the game can look a little better. And that's it for today. Optimize early, I highly recommend it. Otherwise, you're gonna go through the heartbreaking process of just ripping everything you loved about your game out of your game. Whereas if you know what your core fundamentals are, you can create something great with just that. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Feel free to join the Discord, link below in the description. Uh, a lot of cool people there who can help you out with your Unity games. Have a good day.